Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming on this uh, rainy afternoon. Uh, this year, clearly, Portland can't make up its mind as to whether it's going to be Portland or Southern California. Uh, but we've enjoyed these little glimpses of how good summer can be. Um, this is a great uh, week, I know. And for, for those of you, of course, who are uh, giving the exams, you're probably now having regrets about how much writing you required in the exam, so <laughs> how many papers you assigned, and I, I well remember that feeling. It's like, what was I thinking? Um, but at the same time, at least we know uh, the end is nigh. And, uh, and of course, we have the wonderful celebration this uh, Sunday with our uh, first experience, an experiment with a, with a double command, commencement class in the morning and everybody else in, in the afternoon. And I know a lot of the schools have their individual ones before that. So it'll be a wonderful celebratory weekend and hopefully for the weekend the weather will have cleared up again. Um, I'm going to give just a little bit of an overview of the highlights of the year. After that, uh, our provost, Sonna Andrews, will talk about focusing on some of the uh, things going on in the academic side of the house particularly, uh, followed by uh, Vice President Monica Rimai, who will talk about the budget and the budget process. And if all works well, we will have some reasonable amount of time left for Q&A uh, at the end. And then all that stuff hiding under those white sheets or whatever are, is actually food and drink. So that will be the reward. So let me just start by talking about, you know, that this again has been an incredibly productive year for Portland State on all the metrics that the Oregon University system measures us on. Uh, we are either doing better than the goal or we made progress uh, compared to last year. Even the most important to me metric of all that, you know, last year we had 6,165 graduates, and this year we'll have 15 more, 6,180 graduates, which of course, once again, is more graduates than any university in Oregon has ever had in one year. In addition to that, you know, this is very important because this is sort of the first 40-40-20 cohort that we've all been talking about, so we're moving in the right direction. And we also had more residents than ever before, uh, more uh, rural Oregonians, which is a particular sort of catch group in the uh, OUS metrics, uh, and more minority uh, uh, Oregonians. So we're doing well in the things that we really care, care about. Uh, our freshman retention was up again. And that, as you know, has been a, a real key thing for me to make sure that we uh, are making progress on that, because that still isn't where it ought to be. Uh, as I said, the total number of degrees is up, but also the degrees in shortage areas, uh, such as in uh, science and engineering. Our community service learning hours are up from what they were the year before. Our fundraising is up. It's 25% sort of year to date if you count the exact dollars by the strict rule, but if you count the commitments that you know, are sort of conditional, like the money won't really come in until the bu building is going to be built, if you count those and include those, we're actually up something like 50% from the year before. So our investments in advancement and development, I think, have really, have really paid, up, uh, paid off. Our uh, research, uh, funded research, was up pat last year, which is sort of where we have the official metric over the year before, $69.5 million total. That may be the high watermark for a little while, because this year it looks like we're uh, falling a little bit behind that because of the end of the uh, stimulus funding, uh, the federal sequestration that is hurting us. So we're seeing a bit of a flattening of the research. We hope that in a couple of years that we'll begin to uh, pick up again. And very importantly, our metrics in terms of diversity are up. Our student diversity is up. Our faculty diversity is up. Now, all of this good work uh, results in uh, some wonderful rankings, you know, recognition by the, by the outside world. And I'm not going to go through this because uh, you can all read for sure. Uh, but, you know, I'm really very proud in how we continue to be recognized, not just by that perennial U.S. News and World Report, uh, but also by places like the U.S. Green Building Council and Second Nature. All of our work where we've said sustainability is our key distinguishing characteristic that is paying off in people really uh, saying, yes, you guys are doing uh, a great job on that. Um, the, 
As you know, a lot of our work that we do as a university and a lot of our values and commitment can be phrased as, on the one hand, providing opportunity and access, and on the other hand, providing excellence. Except, of course, in an ideal world, they're not other hands, they're truly you know, joined together. Um, we see that in such things like uh, the doubling of our students in the honors program, which we call the only urban honors program in Oregon. And it's just uh, doing great work under the leadership of Director Anne-Marie Fallon and her colleagues. And the honors program received a million dollar challenge grant from the Rose Tucker Trust to really help grow that program. And I think we'll see much more to come in the years to come. Another example of that excellence is the third cohort of the Intel Vietnam scholars. This year, we had 21 students start uh, 16 of them are women. Intel wanted to increase the female participation in that wonderful uh, uh, education program, and we were very proud of that partnership. Our uh, GPA for freshmen was up. It's now up to 3.36, and the transfer GPA was up again to 3.21. And we already talked to, uh, about a little bit, I mentioned the increase uh, in diversity. One particular number there uh, was that our underrepresented minorities in the freshmen this year were 28.3%. And we're the only university in Oregon where that percentage exceeds the percentage of underrepresented minorities in Oregon uh, high schools on the whole and the population Oregon on the whole. So we are doing better than just you know, looking at the comparative numbers. And I really want to thank uh, our Chief Diversity Officer, Hilma Manassas, and her wonderful staff in doing all the work that they have accomplished. You know, and this didn't just come about by you know, sit, sitting back. We've been much more involved in going out to things like uh, national Hispanic college recruitment fairs in Arizona and other states, uh, involving the Black United Fund in our recruitment efforts, bringing over 700 uh, underrepresented minority students and their families to campus for a program that we call Bridges to really make it as easy as possible for them to, to come to campus. Uh, we produced these You Belong videos, which many of you may have seen, hired three diversity uh, retention coordinators serving well over a thousand students. We opened up a new Veterans Resource Center. and. All of you have all as well participated in the new online training program, Creating a Culture of Respect. Very important things to make sure that we all know what we're doing, why we're doing it, how we create a culture of respect and acceptance. And you know, we see continually that we need that. The recent incidents about free speech and you know, what is the limit of free speech and at what point does it really become disrespect for other people. You know, these are not simple, easy issues, uh, but they are really an important part of, in an institution, knowing where you draw those lines and, and showing that respect. Um, Another area that we're very proud of is in the whole area of enrollment management and student affairs. And I want to thank Vice President Jackie Balzer and her whole crew working on uh, increasing the recruitment so we can get more students in and get more of them in smoothly and easily. And much to Jackie's dismay, uh, this past spring, uh, my daughter uh, went through the application process, and I'm glad to say that she was admitted, and she will be a Viking uh, this coming fall. I'm actually running off right after this event to make sure that she really graduates, because today they have their official uh, ceremony. She has a different last name than mine, so you won't know she's here. You know, Otherwise, she probably wouldn't have come, I suspect. <laughs> um, but I can now personally attest to uh, both how you know, involved that whole process is and how many touches there are with students to make sure that they go from that initial inquiry to all the way depositing their money for the intent to enroll, getting into the dorm and all, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, that matters, that creates a connection and then translates into greater retention and, and graduation. Uh, creating more student life so that our campus is a lively and, and wonderful place and that's been going very well. Again, on the, on the research area, I want to thank Vice President John Fink and, and his colleagues. We already talked about uh, the increase, but I just want to show you uh, some of the stuff that's been going on. 
Um, you know, we talk a lot about our local engagement, and it's very important, but that shouldn't uh, hide the fact that most of our research is funded by the feds, just like, you know, the big boys. Uh, and it's a good thing because the feds are the ones that pay the indirect costs that are such an important part of keeping the whole operation afloat. So it's HHS, the NSF, Department of Education, uh, our good friends at the Department of Defense. Uh, you know, very, that's actually a, a big grant to uh, help uh, veterans uh, with uh, employment opportunities and getting integrated back in the labor force. Uh, and we see how important our College of Liberal Arts is, as you would expect. Uh, Dean Subedi doing a, a great job with all her colleagues. School of Social Work, which historically, uh, Dave Springer and Nancy Korolov, who's going to take over as interim dean, uh, who continue to be such great contributors to our research productivity. Uh, engineering, of course, with Dean Sue and Urban and Public Affairs, uh, Larry Wallach, and who will be succeeded by Carlos Crespo as uh, an interim dean and everybody else who's working on this. The other one, I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but you know, just kind of seeing the numbers of the, some of these very large research grants that people are engaged in. And I always love it when uh, a, a research project has a title that I don't really understand. One day I'm gonna ask Kevin Reynolds to explain to me uh, what he's really doing when he's not keeping track of our money, because I sure don't understand it, but I know it's important. Um, and you know there are more uh, uh, like that uh, that are some extremely applied, some of them you know really uh, path breaking, advancing the frontiers of knowledge in in, in a wonderful way. And I want to thank all of the faculty, whether they're, you're doing the funded research, whether you do the big grants or not, who contribute to making Portland State, you know, when we talk about an anchor institution, being an engaged institution, yes, it's about the teaching, it's about the outreach and service activities, it's also about doing cutting edge research that helps uh, either just advance knowledge, helps local businesses, help government perform to the greatest level of, of effectiveness and efficiency. Um, and then there are other forms of scholarship that maybe don't have a lot of money associated, but you know, hosting a thousand researchers, I had a chance to talk to that group. They were here late last summer uh, doing work on, on, on global warming. Of course, Ivan Sutherland in engineering getting the Kyoto Prize, just an amazing uh, achievement for an institution like Portland State to have a researcher of that uh, caliber. And I was told, I listed these articles in Nature Magazine just because I was told that there has never been a university that in one year had that many articles in Nature, which is one of the most prestigious scientific uh, uh, journals. We're, we're not onto the view from academic affairs just yet. Uh, we'll get to there in a moment though. Um, in addition to these projects that I mentioned, we have this en engagement and partnerships in the area of education. We have, according to the way that we keep track of it, 530 external partners. I mean, that's what makes Portland State really what it is. It's these intensive partnerships. Uh, our work with OHSU, focusing of course both on the new life sciences building uh, and the planning for the School of Public Health and several new research areas around cancer research. Uh, our work uh, with the Metro STEM partnership funded by Intel and others that created a STEM center to really increase the number of uh, Portland area high schoolers who are capable of undertaking the hard work in the, in the STEM fields. Uh, the uh, work with the Cradle to Career Partnership, all hands raised, looking at the whole education pipeline from preschool all the way to college that our School of Education and others have been such leaders in creating, and boy, is that I think paying off in the recognition and respect that the university uh, get. In the area of economic development, we created the Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship, which takes in both our Portland State Business Accelerator uh, that is owned by uh, the foundation, uh, but that has many of our faculty and students involved, created a new uh, athletic and outdoor industry certificate program. Uh, established the Northwest Economic Research Center when Tom Patowski came back from being the state economist and got back on the faculty. And have you noticed how the economy started improving as soon as Tom left? You know, so don't ever let him go back to be the state's economist again, because it's nothing but misery. Uh, I talked a little bit about fundraising, but you know, looking forward, 
with the work that we're doing, uh, we are in the middle of a scholarship campaign where we're trying to raise $50 million. Uh, we have raised about 14 of that. So we're well on our way there. For the Stott Center renovation and expansion, we have a goal of 25 million. We've raised 10 million. And we hope to get the approval from the state for their part of that, for the bonding. Uh, for the School of Business, we're raising $20 million. There we're at 13 and a half. So we're making good progress on all of our capital campaigns. And then uh, the latest one, the Lincoln Glass Tower, which is about a $3.5 million project. And we're at about $2.5 million uh, for that. But we're going to go ahead and, and build it. And I think Barbara Sestak, who's done such a great job, I think is going to write a personal check to make up, <laughs> make up the difference there at the end. The other big thing that we, uh, that we worked on uh, relates to uh, governance, and I really want to thank uh, Chief of Staff Lois Davis and General Counsel uh, David Reese, who spent a lot of time, along with the Government Affairs staff, in Salem. And let me tell you, that is no fun place to be when session is going on. Uh, but we think it will all end well. We will get our own board. You know, there's still some details to be worked out. And we will see what happens exactly on the budget. But Monica will probably say some things there. So looking forward to the coming year, um, we uh, will start implementing that new board. We will start building some of these buildings, or at least issue RFPs for it. Uh, we will very much continue on the Rethink PSU effort that uh, Sana will talk about in a minute. We will keep working hard on the fundraising uh, campaign, but we'll also continue our focus on increasing enrollment management, so getting more students in, increasing retention and graduation of our students, implement the new budget model, and even with some of the challenges, push for the research, and continue to enhance diversity. I continue to be very excited about Portland State. I know we're going through some tough period now. We're still trying to balance the budget, and I'll come that, back to that at the very end of the presentation. Uh, but we all know the economy is at least back on a more positive path. I think that is going to help us going forward. And I just want to thank everybody for all your work this past year. And I hope you will all be able to kind of celebrate and take a step back as we, this Sunday, celebrate the success of all of our graduates. Uh, thank you very much. And let me now ask Sana Andrews to come up to talk about the academic affairs. Sana. So they gave me a stool to stand on, but I'm afraid I'll fall off of it, so I'm moving it to the side. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. I realized as I was walking over here that it's been about a little over nine months is the last time that I addressed a, a very diverse group of Portland State University employees at Convocation. And uh, boy, those nine months have gone by very, very quickly. So what I thought I would do today is, is that I would kind of start from where I left off um, at Convocation. And Monica, you don't have to worry. There's no Prezi to make you sick with all of this. But for those of you that were at the Convocation, I started that by sort of asking the question, you know, if the world is flat, why is everything spinning? And at the end of the Convocation, and at the beginning of the Convocation, sort of came back to our five themes at Portland State the things that are really important to us as an institution. And so what I'd like to do this afternoon, just very briefly, is highlight a few of the things that we've done. It certainly won't be everything, but a few of the things that we've done that really help move us forward on these five themes. So you see some of them just listed here. Um, Vim mentioned already, we've made some, some great progress in student success. We still have a long way to go. But in particular, we've really done well on the, some of the things in terms of degree maps. And I really want to thank all of the faculty for doing this. I know it was a lot of work, but it means so much for our students to be able to map out their career here at Portland State and figure out how to navigate through our programs. We've also um, affected this reverse transfer. And I, I'm going to just spend a second on that because I'm not sure everybody knows what that is, and I'd like to thank Jackie and her team a lot for this. But 
What's now possible at Portland State is for a student who transfers here from a community college who hasn't completed their associate degree to transfer credits back to that community college so that that community college can offer them the associate degree they earn. So kind of the opposite of what we think about in transfer, usually students are transferring their degrees to, or their credits to us in order for us to grant the degree, we're transferring credits back to the community college so the student can get their associate degree while they're working on their baccalaureate degree. Many institutions have done this around the country. It's a real motivator for students, kind of gives them something along the way. We had a number of tenure and, and faculty promotions. You can see the number there. Um, big news was we created a college, the College of the Arts, which used to be the School of Fine and Performing Arts, and all of the departments within that college are now schools. And the Collaborative Life Sciences Building, if you drive down on that south waterfront, you can't help but see this enormous, enormous building going up. And as many of you know, Portland State University will have some teaching laboratories there and some research laboratories there, and it really provides a nice opportunity for us to have a collaboration with both OHSU and OSU, who will also be in that building. And the Joint School of Public Health. Um, this is, I always want to put the word potential Joint School of Public Health, um, but we're really working toward a Joint School of Public Health with OHSU. I held a campus-wide information session last week. A number of you were there. I think we had a great conversation about the work that's been done so far. And the only thing I'll say about it is, is that OHSU and Portland State if we are able to create this School of Public Health, we'll be equal partners in that. So this will be a school within PSU and a school within OHSU. So it's not like OHSU will have the School of Public Health and we'll just be a part of it. It is a joint partnership. These are just a list of some of the new degree programs. Um, the last um, one has yet to be approved by the uh, OUS Board of Higher Education, but some of the new programs that many of you have worked on this year. And then one of the things that, of course, I'm going to talk a little bit about is the sort of rethink PSU and, 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 the, and the provost challenge. And I always feel when I have an audience, I'm able to explain where the $3 million came from because everyone asks me, well, where did that $3 million come from? Remember, we uh, have an online fee that we charge students, and we had $3 million of the restricted money that really allowed us to put a challenge out there. And at the convocation, you don't need to read these little things, I showed these three slides. What would students be asking? What would faculty be asking? What would the provost be asking? What would the president be asking about what we should be doing at Portland State in terms of using technology in order to advance things in the curriculum? And I didn't have any answers. And the great news is all of you did. So we had the provost challenge, and it was really impressive. There were over 1,000 individual faculty and staff at this institution that had their name associated with one or more of the 162 concepts that were submitted for the provost challenge. I think that's really amazing. I tell colleagues about that across the country and they're just overwhelmed. That's a th almost a third of our employees. We ended up in making some decisions over the last month or two and I just want to share with you what those are. Um, and these are the Reframing and Acceleration Challenge Awards. These are ones that we're going to either move some programs online or really revise the curriculum in some way. And you can see the list of them here. It's quite a range. Um, the awards are significant, and the groups that have these are now starting to work on them. So we've got things like um, the mathematics and statistics really working on changing the way they teach those courses. Um, we've got um, a set of online courses that will create scaffolding for our um, degrees. We've got something on credit for prior learning, the giving credit where credit is due. Um, this um, chemistry and biology are working together to do some really innovative things in teaching our introductory courses. And then our School of Business Administration has three proposals um, that are being funded um, that all have to do with online delivery as well as using credit for prior learning and shortening the time to degree. 
And then I just want to show you this list of the inspiration challenges. These were the smaller ones, the smaller awards that were somewhere between five and 20,000. We have quite a few of these. You can see the range. I'm just going to flip through the slides. On textbooks, on mentoring, um, on badges, on mobility and, and, and reality resources for learning, quite a few things. So the hope is, is that these kinds of activities, these things that are being funded by the Provost Challenge, is the first wave of Rethink PSU. So I would like to make sure that everybody knows we're not done doing the work. We've just sent out the first um, set of folks to, to do this, and there's plenty and plenty of work to do. We really need to spend our time thinking about how we offer degrees to students that are effective, that are something that they can afford, that they can do in a reasonable amount of time, and that have real relevance. So I end with the work ahead, because the work ahead is just like the work that we started the year in, and that is moving Portland State forward on these areas, these five themes that have been identified a number of years ago for the institution. And we have a lot of work to do, but it's just been great, actually. I think as a new person, you're able to actually look at what happened in a year, because you don't get it sort of mixed up with what happened two or three years ago. And it's just been amazing the work that all of you have done to really move this institution forward. I'm really impressed by it all. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Monica Remai to talk about the budget. I am no less graceful than um, Sana, so I'm going to move this too. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to come uh, give you a summary on where things stand with the budget. I, I seem to have impeccable timing with this presentation. Uh, last week, when I shared this information with the Senate, I was uh, the faculty Senate. I was literally between them and a wine tasting event, and now I'm between you and some. So I'm going to try and uh, get through this uh, in a fairly efficient fashion. For those who have uh, more detailed questions that you'd rather not uh, leave to our Q&A period, please do feel free to reach out and uh, uh, email or give me a call. I'd be, I'd be happy to answer those very specific questions. Um, I, I think th what the, uh, the great information, the highlights that both President Vivell and Provost Andrews shared with you are a testimony to a very important spirit at Portland State, and that is despite some very challenging financial times that we are facing as a community, our passion for the work that we do continues. And that's very much evidenced in um, all the, the great highlights that were just shared. I also would say that it is evidenced by the wonderful contributions that all of you in this room have made to this year's budget process. And so I have to begin uh, this summary with a heartfelt thanks to all of my colleagues, uh, the deans and their faculty, my vice presidential colleagues, uh, the crew in finance and administration. Uh, we did this work together, and I think uh, the transparency, the accuracy is reflected in the community approach we're taking to managing some, some pretty uh, challenging times. So um, we are at the end of a biennia, and I think it is appropriate for us to spend a moment to reflect on where we started and, and sort of how we got to this place in time. Okay, so technology... Oh, here we go. So we started with some, some really pretty big challenges. Um, when you take into consideration the costs in our benefits packages, which we don't control, uh, that were not funded by the state, together with a pretty significant uh, cut in state appropriations, uh, uh, all on top of our, our beginning to experience flat or even declining enrollment, we began uh, this current biennia with a $31 million problem. 
Um, but uh, despite its challenge, I think we took a very appropriate approach and decided that we would respond in a measured fashion, and that is to leverage the tools that we had uh, before us, not to rely on any one particular tool, but really to uh, pull all of these levers in order to uh, begin to reach a balanced budget. And, and frankly, I would say that we did that quite effectively, uh, save for one issue, and that is that um, we missed on our enrollment uh, forecast. And we missed, you know, by a significant amount when it was all said and done. Uh, the percentage by which we were off resulted in about a $10 million hole in our revenue projections. Now, we, we had some options at that point, and, and this became very apparent, and the revenue implications for us became very apparent about in, in January. Um, some institutions at that time would have elected to, to take a, do mid-year budget rescissions and start um, taking those cuts right away. I think we elected, thanks to some flexibility afforded by our uh, pretty healthy fund balance uh, at that point, to manage uh, this $10 million shortfall on a one-time basis using our fund balance. And frankly, that's exactly why we have a fund balance, so that we can address unforeseen circumstances. Um, having said that, we knew all along, and we discussed this with the deans and discuss this with the faculty uh, senate budget committee and, and others that we would need to roll this problem forward and so in a sense we began planning for fiscal year 14 and 15 with a 10 million dollar hole but again i think keeping with our approach of being measured and deliberate and asking all parts of the community to participate in building our budgets and solving these problems we uh, once again chose to leverage all those tools uh, that we had before us uh, to, be, to begin building these budgets. This, uh, this planning cycle, though, uh, for the first time, I think, in a very long time, we had a fourth tool, not one that we control, uh, one that our partners in the legislature and in the governor's office control, and that comes in the form of state appropriations. And, uh, I would also say that we added to this process of being measured and taking advantage of, of what the community could offer, we added to that being much more data-driven and informed uh, by what we knew to be the environment around us. So um, we, we began uh, with tuition, with uh, the, the largest component of our revenue uh, picture. And in this case, we were informed by a pretty important price elasticity study that was put into the field last summer uh, that validated, I think, what a lot of people knew, which is at this point in our history, Portland State's pricing of tuition is beginning to have an impact on students and that potential students and continuing students um, are price sensitive. I know that doesn't uh, seem like a whole lot of um, exciting new news, especially for the students in the room, uh, but in fact, understanding the nuances of the categories of students, out-of-state versus in-state, grad versus undergrad, even segmented populations within that was very important in informing our, our pricing around tuition. We were also very informed by input from uh, students through our Student Budget Advisory Committee, and ultimately where we landed on was uh, this 3% plus 1.5%. And the reason that we divide this up is because our base tuition for in-state undergraduate students is increasing by 3%. But in an effort to recognize the, the world around us, uh, we've also recognized that charging a separate fee for students who take online courses uh, put us at a competitive disadvantage. So this year we're eliminating the hybrid fee uh, and we are uh, scaling back on the uh, pure online fee that we charge on top of tuition. But of course, those, those two tuition uh, uh, or additional fees generate revenue that certain units rely on. And so we have folded uh, part of, not all, but part of the lost revenue associated with eliminating the hybrid fee and reducing the online fee into our tuition. So that rolls up to about a 4.5% increase for in-state undergraduates and being very cognizant of the information that we learned around price elasticity, 1% for all other categories. In terms of enrollment, uh, here too, uh, we became much more educated thanks to the great work of Associate Vice President Cindy Scarupa and the strategic enrollment planning initiatives uh, that she has been leading in collaboration with all the other units on campus, particularly our academic colleagues. 
So after um, a very deliberate process that was engaging and driven by uh, environmental scans and what experts were telling us, we have arrived at what we think is an appropriately conservative revenue forecast associated with um, uh, with enrollment that is likely to be flat on the undergraduate side and uh, declining on the, the graduate enrollment side. Now, in terms of the revenue implications, uh, this is likely to mean that uh, in, uh, our revenue will be slightly lower uh, revenue from enrollment than last year because the impact of graduate enrollment is so much smaller on our, on our revenue picture than on the um, undergraduate side. So finally, the good news, uh, and that comes in the form of state appropriations. I know all of you probably by now have heard uh, that the, the governor and frankly the legislature as well was very interested in providing us some relief associated with our retirement benefits. And so uh, we, uh, we know that we'll get some of it. We're likely to even get a little bit more in the waning hours of the legislative process. And on top of that, the governor continues to be supportive of sending additional state appropriations our way. Uh, that could take lots of different forms. We've been relatively conservative about forecasting what additional support we might get, um, but that is the good news. So in terms of uh, the first few levers that we have available to us, I think we're, um, we were in good shape, uh, very much informed by uh, data and information, um, but we still were left with a, a rather significant hole in our operating budget based upon the staffing plans and the, and the work that all of you did, a hole of $18 million. That is um, no small amount. And so we had no choice but to pull the fourth lever, which is expenditure reduction. And we've decided again, in very consistent with our commitment to being measured in how we manage things, uh, to look at this on a two-year horizon, to really recognize that $18 million is a, is a long way to go in terms of permanent cuts. And so for this year, we have elected to take only a 2.3% cut um, which is about a little less than $6 million, uh, and taking the remaining amount in the form of uh, one-time money, so the remaining $12 million and some change, uh, we would use our fund balance to cover uh, so that we could get to that $18 million mark for this year, but recognizing that we need to permanently balance uh, the budget in the second year of, of the of, uh, this biennia in fiscal year 15. And I'll, I'll say a mo uh, something about that in a moment. But I, I wanted to spend just a few moments here talking about the process uh, related to how we took the 2.3%. Uh, These were cuts that were um, allocated to all divisions across the board. So everyone took uh, was required to come up with plans for taking a 2.3% reduction in their general funds uh, expenditure budget. Um, but within each division, vice presidents uh, allocated that strategically through a very iterative process. The university budget team participated to some extent in hearing what the plans were and providing feedback. Uh, these were principal decisions and they were designed around protecting our core functions. And so while all units participated in the 2.3%, at, at a um, sort of a subunit level, certain departments other uh, subunits within the university may have taken actually a higher percentage cut depending on how each vice president chose to allocate their share of the approximately $6 million in permanent cuts. So, um, you know, for those of you in the back of the room, cover your left eye and read the top line of this chart. Um, this, this information is going to be available on the Finance and Administration website under, uh, the, at our front page under a tab called Presentations, so you're more than welcome to spend a lot of time looking at that. What, I, I put this up here not because I expect all of you to be able to see the numbers, but because I'm hoping that you will recognize this document. Uh, this is a portion of our five-year forecast. The goal here is for us to begin to look at these budget numbers consistently uh, so that all of you who are interested can compare year over year and you can decide for yourself whether the information I'm sharing with you and others are sharing with you is in fact accurate. I think it's very helpful and, and keeps us very um, sort of transparent in how we do our work. 
Um, this is a sort of looks at where we think we're going to end fiscal year 13, the current year, and I think we're, we're going to be pretty spot on because we're so close to the end of the fiscal year. It then contains the information that I've just outlined for you in fiscal year 14. Uh, so the revenue includes the increase in tuition that I've described as well as some assumptions around increased state appropriations. On the expenditure side, um, we have assumed some increase in compensation for all uh, employees. I, I say this somewhat hesitantly because, of course, a significant n a number of our community is represented by collective bargaining organizations. We don't want to get ahead of that. On the other hand, not assuming that there would be any increases in compensation that would flow through to all units, that seemed to be you know, pretty irresponsible uh, on our part. So we, we chose 3% across the board. I have no idea where our process will land in terms of working with our union colleagues, but 3% seemed to be reasonable. And when you spend some time looking at this document, you can, you know, you get a sense of what happens if you increase or, or decrease that assumption. And that gets pushed through, by the way, to fiscal year uh, 15. Um, other expenditure assumptions in there is uh, some PERS relief, as I mentioned before, and then some uh, additional investments to reflect the priorities that both uh, Sana and uh, Vim talked about. So some additional support uh, to advancement to help support the great work they're doing around our philanthropic effort. Uh, some additional support to the Office of Information Technology so that we can actually implement some of the great ideas that all of you came up with associated with the Provost Challenge. Um, some additional support for uh, deans, new dean searches that were, are likely uh, to be required. And as the president mentioned, beginning to put some resources aside to support a new board. So not a lot, um, but this does allow us to be more planful in our thinking. And of course, you see in there, assume the um, approximately $6 million in permanent cuts. And then further down on the line, uh, we are then closing that $18 million gap that I talked about before uh, with one-time funding, about 12.6 when it's all said and done. So what does that mean for fiscal year 15? I think it means that the work continues and that as a community we need to come together uh, to decide how we're going to manage a much more significant reduction in our expenditures somewhere around 5%. Uh, given all of your experience in the last few years with percentage cuts plus or minus 2%, I would be the first to say that 5% seems daunting. But given the tremendous work that all of you did this year, the quality of the conversation that we had with the deans, with other unit heads, I'm very confident that together we will, we will figure out how to reinvent Portland State uh, so that as a community we can make some very strategic decisions about the kinds of things we'll invest in and the kinds of things that we won't do any longer. Um, so our next steps in terms of the budget is that we're going to finalize things in the next couple of weeks. We have some work to do about how uh, uh, units will spend their one-time funds. Um, and then we will load the budgets. And the promise that we have made, and I think we're in good shape to stick to, is that we will have everybody's budgets up and ready to go by July 1st, which I understand from the history of Portland State is a miracle. Um, but it, it's thanks to all of you uh, that we can celebrate this miracle. Before closing and, and turning it back to Vim, I wanted to say a, a, just a word about where we are with performance-based budgeting. I think many of you in the room are aware that we've been doing some work around understanding how much we actually spend to raise a dollar of revenue. Uh, we have developed a tool that is the Revenue and Cost Attribution Tool, or RCAT. Um, and we had some really good discussions just this last month with the steering committee, the performance-based budget steering committee, about how we might now leverage this information uh, toward developing a new budget model. A budget model, by the way, that I think will help inform how we begin to attack this next year's big challenge, that is the fiscal year 15 challenge in uh, budget uh, or expenditure reduction. So the commitment that we have made is to fully develop this model uh, over the course of fiscal year 14 and be ready for implementation 
uh, in time for fiscal year 15. So stay tuned, uh, much more about that. So uh, that concludes my overview of the budget. Before we open it up to uh, q and I think uh, President Vivell wanted to say a, a, few, a few more words. Uh, thank you very much, Monica. No, actually, I will turn it over, open it up to q and I will leave my uh, closing remarks to the closing. Um, so, and there are roving mics around, and we have a mic here for my colleagues when they need uh, to answer one of the questions. So we got a question right here. Hi, my name's Carrie Booth. Well, you want the mic to be on, too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it is on already, and it's just the people in the back who have to actually activate it. Try Slid it up now. There we go. Hi, I'm Carrie Booth. I have taught at PSU every summer for the last 24 years, and I love teaching here. This was going to be my 25th. I found out yesterday both of my classes, which one of them was fully enrolled, have been canceled. And by my calculations, that's losing $40,000 for the school. I just did a simple, you know, tuition times number of students minus my salary. So I'm having trouble understanding the budgetary. So I'll be in contact with you. And I left a note in your office and a few other offices around campus this afternoon just to see. I'm trying to advocate for my 45 students who need introduction to genetics to start on Monday, June 24th, if at all possible. Right. I don't know whether Sana or Sue uh, want to. Uh, uh, Sue, do you want to uh, respond to that? I think because there's a class in, in biology. I'm not uh, sure want is the right word. Uh. Um, so this is part of the reductions that we've had to implement in the College of Liberal Arts and Sciences. And we found that in terms of this revenue um, versus expenditure um, and the number of students overall served, that reducing some of the summer offerings was a much more cost-effective way to implement reductions than doing that during the normal academic year. And so as a result, um, departments within the college have had to make some very difficult um, decis decisions and choices about what courses um, won't be able to be offered um, during the summer. And I do understand entirely that this causes difficulties for those who are to teach the courses and difficulties for the students who were hoping to take the courses. And in combination with talking to the departments, um, talking to your advisors, um, we hope to at least help um, chart new pathways to um, getting the courses during the regular academic year and charting your course toward uh, graduation. But I certainly acknowledge that this is not going to be an easy path for everybody. Thank you. Other, so in, in some cases, I think classes that are canceled are classes that students will take during the regular academic year. So it was actually an additional cost for us. And, and, the, and that's how I assume that decision was made. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a loss to convenience. Cuts have consequences, absolutely. Well, a lot of summer students don't go to PSU, but. But most actually do, uh, yeah. Um, other questions? Uh, yes, Tom. So uh, just a math question for uh, Vice Provost Ramai. If a 2% overall budget cut in the first year translates into an effective 2.3% across the board. What does 5.2 in the second year translate into? I'm guessing close to six, but that's just a guess. So um, one, you did catch me on a math issue here, and that is that the overall cut 2% uh, equates to 2.3% when we take into account that there are some um, uh, some expenditures that we can't cut, for example, debt service. So just a point there. Um, where's Alan? Alan, you, is, is the second year, what are we talking about in terms of the five point, the five point something? What, what was the? It, it depends on are there certain things that we're saying we can't cut this year? I mean, I, I think the conversations around what are the things that are off the table is that really nothing is off the table. So to be determined, but what's the dollar figure just uh, of a, f a five, I think it's 5.3% in year two? Yeah, I think it was. 
It's on. It's on. I think it was 5.2. So, I mean, if you, if you roughly said we're excluding the same type of things, I think it would be probably 5.7. Right. I would add to that, and we may go about it differently, Tom. In the short term, you can't get out of the lease. You can't change your energy contract. Right? You know, so there are certain things that are fixed. Having a year ahead, you can say, well, guys, we're just going to have to think about energy reduction. We're going to have to give up some leases. Now, there are some, you certainly can't get out of bond payments, obviously. Uh, but so, and Monica and I talked about it this morning, we're trying to put as little as possible on the can't touch this list, so that that cut that we have to take can be spread over as big a base as possible. We but, haven't done the work yet in the details. And, and I think that, but the question was how much in dollars? That's what I heard, and it's probably somewhere around 13 million. Nobody also wanted to know what percentage yeah. does this wind up being? Yeah. Is it really five and a half, or is it really five? Is it really yeah. five point nine or six? So we we don't have the precise answer to that because it depends on what winds up being open, but in a way it, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary because we know that in our, as we make any decision to cut, there are all kinds of things that we can't cut. For instance, we have, you know, tenured faculty here. We can't get rid of tenured faculty. That's a fixed cost in that sense. So if now you look at the percentage cut over everybody else, over everything else, it is much bigger than that 5%. You know, so there are all kinds of things that you can say, well, th that is fixed. Uh, so you know, it sort of depends on what do you consider the base. Uh, I, Albert, let me say, talk a little bit more about this, because it is a very tough exercise. We actually debated whether this coming year we would not do a cut at all for this coming year, and then take the 7 and a half or whatever it would add up to for the FY15, so that we would have more time so that we could do less across the board and more really strategic based on you know, strategic priorities and, as people say, what are we going to stop doing? Uh, I, I found that too scary, I guess is a simple way of saying it. Uh, I, I thought it was too scary to push that much of a cut uh, ahead of us, so that's why we landed on doing uh, 2 2.5% 2 now and, and the rest next year. I have to say it's also somewhat driven by uh, hope that we do better on the enrollment management and that we may see continuing hope on the state side that might, you know, at least change those numbers a little bit. They're not going to make them go away. It's not going to be, but, you know, make, help us a little bit. It will require us this coming year, and we'll be doing the initial planning for that this summer, to think about both the process and the substance of how we're going to create this process of talking about what are the things that we can cut that are major. Because uh, you can't keep doing just 5% out of every single budgetary category. So there will be a deeper debate about what are the priorities. And inevitably, we will be cutting some things that are good, productive, wonderful activities. You know, we, we do not have a lot, if, if any, activities that are you know, stupid and wasteful. Uh, you know, so it's not an easy task. It's not, it won't be an easy task, but we'll go about it. We have the whole year to plan for it. And we will develop the process by which we do that. So in that sense, we'll have more time than we had this year. Yes, you've got a mic coming behind you. I'm Andrew Black in computer science. Um, if I understood uh, the presentation correctly, part of the reason we were in difficulty this year was that we projected enrollments to increase, and in fact, they decreased. Um, so I presume that we're taking all possible actions to understand why that happened and to boost, you know, to boost enrollments next year. Um, so I was a bit surprised to find out that the one um, school whose enrollments actually increased this year, which was engineering, is being punished for that by getting the same budget cuts everybody else gets. So we should surely be careful not to do that again. Well, as you know, that is not the decision of an individual faculty member. But uh, one of the challenges with the School of Engineering, of course, is that depending on where the students come in, the more students, the more money we lose. All right? Not, we, we do not, you know, in, in, as, this is one of the things that the RCATS model really helped us figure out. Where does growth bring more revenue? And where does growth actually increase the deficit? There are several colleges where growth increases the deficit. So that's definitely one issue. Again, this year, we 
did not do the cuts in the strategic way of saying, well, this is the more important activity, that's the less important. Now, there's some of that because, as you know, the provost asked all colleges to come up with proposals for 4% cuts in order to ultimately come down to about that 2.3% uh, cut. So she, in collaboration with the deans, will be making decisions to make sure that we protect those things that generate revenue and that are priorities for other reasons, and that the most severe cuts will be on those things that seem to be least effective in generating revenue or do otherwise not fit best with our priorities. So that's how it has been done and will continue to be done. Um, yes. Hello, Mr. Weevil. My name is Sean Mahoney. I'm a student here in the engineering department, as a matter of fact. Um, so when we're talking about lowering enrollment and we're talking about student engagement, um, I was wondering in creating a national caliber level of school, what actions do you have to plan to increase the level of student engagement? The recent ASPSU election was only 1.7% turnout. And I believe that's a huge issue in creating a meaningful, impactful environment. Yeah, I'm going to ask uh, Vice President Balzer to uh, speak to that issue, which she's hardly the only one who's concerned with student engagement. Uh, obviously, it's a, a lot of things go on in individual schools and colleges and departments, but uh, Jackie certainly has the most general sure. overview of that. Sure, and, and it is true that uh, it is a high priority of the university to continue to increase student engagement and civic engagement of voting, whether it be in a campus election or a national election, is, is very important. And it's very disturbing to us that at one moment we can have engagement increasing dramatically in our resource centers, our clubs, and our organizations, and utilization of, of health services and student services are skyrocketing. Students are absolutely participating in, in the life of campus, and at the same time, you know, that civic responsibility of voting or attending something like this, we're still lagging. Um, we do know that PSU students are quite distracted, um, whether that be many of our students have part-time jobs, um, the staying on track and graduating as efficiently or managing children. We have to be very sophisticated with how we engage students and ask of their time, which is why last year we started with the online voting, figuring that would help get us there. Um, it's a nut I would love to talk more about specifically in terms of voting, but I actually am quite proud of the progress we've made around engagement in general. Um, it has to look different at an urban campus than just voting. It has to look um, like seeing your advisor or attending an uh, orientation or participating in the classroom and research. Um, so I, you know, I wish I had a specific answer for that, but I actually would disagree with you in some respects that I think if you come by and look at the data, utilization and certain types of engagement are at an all-time high for this campus. And we will continue to elevate that priority of student life on this campus because we know our students want it. Um, and the utilization of the fees that we're collecting uh, and the input that we're collecting is really helping us design a campus experience. So all of you next year, you are now charged with talking about voting, um, encouraging voting uh, on campus because we absolutely want to move that metric. Jackie, you want to give the mic to Hilma? She wanted to comment on that as well. Thank you, Jackie. As you know, in student engagement involves more than just voting, and I'm, I'm sorry that that percentage is so low, but this, I have seen tremendous student engagement in other ways. For example, the Cornell West event that we had in January was the best attended uh, session that we've had probably in over 10 years. There were about 2,500 people. And luckily, it was uh, the effort of many students that, that uh, the reason why that was so successful. Similarly with Tim Wise. Marlon can attest, he was one of the key players in putting that event together. Again, we had close to 2,500 people. Not all were students, but the big majority were students. In, in addition, the international night that we had here this year, always one of the best attended student uh, um, events, was absolutely 
phenomenal. So there are other ways to engage. I'm sorry that the voting is low, and hopefully together we can work on that, but there are other ways to engage, and I'm very, very proud of those who have engaged. Just keep the mic there. Uh, question over there in the green shirt. I uh, recently... I recently heard a rumor that PSU is considering leaving the Oregon University system. Can you comment on that for me? Well, it's not a, not a rumor. Uh, uh, the, there is uh, Senate Bill 270, which uh, has been uh, discussed in the legislature, uh, would give the University of Oregon and Portland State their own boards and give the Oregon State University the uh, right to get its own board if the president uh, decides to do that, and he's likely to do so. Uh, that bill is likely to pass, but you know anybody who's ever hung around legislatures knows that it ain't done until it's done, but I think most uh, experts think it's likely to pass. Uh, we will continue to be part of a very strong statewide system in a variety of ways. First of all, the new board will take officially power on July 1, 2014, so it'll be you know a year from now. Uh, we will all all universities will continue to be part of what we call the shared services. A lot of the things that we do jointly now, everything from employee benefits, uh, risk management, treasury, audit functions, for another year beyond that. Uh, the retirement and pension benefit and the health benefits, we will continue to be in the system for uh, an indefinite period. There's no time ending on that. We've been told by the governor we have to stay in that, so we'll stay in that. Um, and then all of the universities, let's say the three big ones with their own board, and then the four regional universities, which may or may not get their own board or have one board for the four of them together, will all report up to the Higher Education Coordinating Council or Commission, uh, which uh, will be also a gubernatorially appointed uh, body. And that body will approve the missions for the universities, approve the achievement compacts, which has the specific kind of metrics that I talked about in my talk, uh, that will review and approve the operating budget and the capital budget, and will have approval authority over all new academic programs. So there will be a significant amount of continued statewide coordination of the whole higher education enterprise. It will not be done under the current State Board of Higher Education and the current Oregon University system. So yes, there's uh, gonna be significant change. You know, the day-to-day -day effect of that on anybody's life, right, sitting here, is probably going to be very modest, if not non-existent. I think the longer-term effect and the reason why um, collectively, we thought having our own board is a good thing is because it gives us a group of people, it's somewhere between 11 and 15, appointed by the governor, who will really be paying attention to this institution. Right now we have a board, State Board of Higher Ed, that runs all seven institutions. And I spend one hour a year talking to that group about Portland State. The rest of the time, the discussions are about you know, general issues. You know, there's no focus on Portland State. So they do not really understand the institution. They do not understand our particular challenges or opportunities, strengths, and weaknesses. I think that a board for PSU will give much greater oversight. Let me tell you, this will not make my life easier. This will not, I will now have 15 bosses who actually pay attention. Right now, I only have one, really, the chancellor. Uh, so these will be people who are paying attention to what this institution is doing, but they will also be deeply connected to the Portland metropolitan community. We will actually be having our partners, the stakeholders, the employers, the school systems, and so on represented on this board, and they will be working with us to make sure that we really serve the needs of this region. So I think it's a very good change. Obviously, as you know, there are only about 2,000 private universities and colleges in the United States that have their own boards, and hundreds and hundreds of public universities, for instance, in Washington, where each university has its own uh, governing board. And, you know, it seems to it seems to work very well. So I think it's a, it's a good change, but you, know, you won't see a lot of changes on the ground uh, in, in the immediate future. It'll play out over a period of time. Um, yes? Hi. Um, so my name is Cameron Frank. Um, I'm a senior in the English department here. And um, so I, I guess you were talking a lot about 
um, you know, cuts across the board and stuff. So since I've been going to school here, my, my tuition has continued to go up. I, I pay in-state tuition, so at least right now it's reasonably affordable um, for me and my family. I, I was wondering if there's any talk of cuts in administrative pay. Um, I know that I think in a fiscal year, your salary is actually about 57 and a half times what I pay. Um, in my tuition for the year. So I was wondering if, if maybe the administration is willing to meet students halfway instead of balancing the budget on the backs of, you know, the people who really own this university. Well, of course, the people who, the people who really own this university are the people, the residents of the citizens of the state of Oregon, right? That's why this university exists and that's why it was created. And that's, and that's why we're, who we're here to serve. The important thing always to know about tuition is that tuition has increased primarily to make up for the cuts in state support. You've probably heard me say this before. The amount of money that we spend per student now after just adjusting for the consumer price index is the same as it was in 1995. We spend about $11,500 per student now. We spend about $11,500 back in 1995. The difference is that in 1995, the state paid 80% and you, the student, paid 20%. Now, the student pays about 70%, the state pays about 20%, and the rest, frankly, is a deficit. Or we make it up through a little bit of philanthropy in a couple of other places. So the problem of the tuition isn't because, you know, even President Obama talked about why are universities raising the tuition so much? Well. The answer for private universities is a different thing. I think private universities are engaged in an arms race, frankly, in a facilities race. At public universities, it's gone up because the state has cut it. We are under-resourced on every measure you can look at in terms of the number of administrators per student or faculty member, however you want to measure it. Uh, we are at about 70% of the median of our peers. In terms of the amount of money we spend on campus maintenance, we're at about 58 cents for every dollar that our peers spend. The amount that we spend on instruction, we're at about 72% of, of our peers. So there's only so much you can cut before you lose the effectiveness of the institution. So that's why we're doing it, as uh, Vice President Riemai said, in a measured way. Some of it comes from tuition increases, some of it comes from making investment in enrollment growth so we can have more students that does reduce the average cost. Uh, some of it comes from, from the cuts, and we will continue to do that. I have, I'll take the next question over there. OK, so I am also a student here, a grad student. And um, given the increase in tuition, and I didn't actually hear a, a comment on either administrative cuts or maybe caps. Um, in salaries or expenditures there. But I'm actually wondering more about investment in student success because while those words were up there, um, I've actually seen very few initiatives at this school for student success. And I'd like to go outside of the rethink challenge because that, while that is very commendable, um, it is next year and outside of the facelifts for the campus. And I'm wondering about actual tangible investments in student success this year. Well. How, how long do you have? There's a lot I'm going to ask both the provost and Jackie to talk about. Why don't we give Sana a chance first? Um, and uh, Sana, you want to? Sure, I, I can do it from here. Oh, thank you. Um, you know, again, I've, as I mentioned when I started, I've only been here for nine months, but I haven't been incredibly impressed with the amount of resources that Portland State, in terms of its overall budget, has put into student success. There's an entire portfolio of student success initiatives, whether it's advisors, whether it's something like the Last Mile program, whether it's something like this reverse transfer that I just talked about. Um, so this institution has, has done a lot. As, as the president said, we still have a lot of work to do. I mean, we are not where we want to be in terms of in terms of student retention. But I, um, you know, I think that this institution has done a lot. And then as we look at the way in which the academic units proposed their reductions this year, one of the principles that they followed was to try to do least harm to instruction and to the success of students. So there were reductions on the administrative side. And as President, uh, Vice President Remai talked about, 
All of the divisions took a 2.3% reduction. That includes all of our administrative units. So I'm sure there are many faculty and staff at, uh, around the room here that could talk more eloquently than I can about the things they're actually doing to improve student success, but there's a lot going on here. Jackie, you want to add to that? I, I no, that was a, uh, just a few things. That was an excellent list. The other things that I would say are the the continued investments or reallocations uh, within some of our efficiencies. So, indeed, helping students access uh, advising or the degree maps, et cetera, things that they need to progress. I'm not sure where the person is that asked the question, but things they need to progress um, to stay on track towards graduation on time. The other side of that in terms of investments of student success um, rely in the areas of enrollment management and student affairs of which being good stewards of the student fees of which you pay. Uh, and I'm quite proud of the fact that over the last four years, and, and indeed some of them fall in this past year, we continued open resource centers or launch support programs or what they call wraparound programs uh, for those students who need support. And in those centers, you see things like academic advising uh, for students that's supplemental to what faculty members are doing or the academic coaching or the mentoring or or the work to support a student as you navigate those those great challenges of your student experience. So this fall we will be opening our Veterans Resource Center and with a thousand veterans on our campus and growing, uh, that's another population that we'll be able to support with a resource center that has a professional staff member in it. Uh, many of you may have noticed the fourth floor of this building is just now alive um, with support services both from the Dean's area uh, but our diversity and multicultural student services which uh, continues to serve larger numbers of students along with our incredibly exploding services for students with children, um, our other more recent center. So lots going on. It's not enough. Um, it certainly um, needs to continue to grow. And, and at this point, what we continue to do is use data to ensure we're deploying the resources that we do have to the highest priority activities that work to promote student success. Our goal is complete, get you in, get you connected, and get you out ready for career as quickly and efficiently as possible for your sakes. All right, I think I got a question back there and then over there. Yes, uh, Debbie, you have a, a mic there? So my name is Jin Jiao, professor in physics and um, mechanical and materials engineering. I noticed from vice presidents for finance showing that the 2% graduate uh, and enrollment uh, decrease. So as a comprehensive university, so the, and the graduate uh, enrollment decrease, which uh, most of our research actually are carried out by the graduate student. So under the current situation, what is the measure will be taken to prevent this kind of uh, decrease, which is super important for the, the, the award and the status and for students' achievement uh, to yeah. continue? Thanks. Yeah, you know, graduate education is very important, but in terms of the research piece, you have to look a little bit, you have to break down where is that uh, decline? A lot of that has been, frankly, in the Graduate School of Education. Uh, because of the funding cuts in K through 12, you know, there have been fewer and fewer teaching jobs, so there have been far fewer people coming back to get their graduate degree in education. So that doesn't directly affect the, uh, the, the research-oriented uh, graduate assistants so much. Uh, San, I don't know whether off the top of your head you can elaborate on that further. Sure. Um, as the president said, we had a significant decline in the Graduate School of Education. However, you know, we were scratching our heads at, at first looking at these declines, and they are national. We are not the only institution. In fact, many institutions around the country are seeing a decline in, in graduate student education. So what are we doing? Because I do think it's important in terms of not only helping to support the research enterprise, but many of the other things we do at Portland State. Um, Margaret Everett um, is working on a number of initiatives, um, putting together uh, a plan for how we actually do recruitment, looking more strategically at how we use remissions for graduate students and the kinds of stipends that graduate students have, really looking at 
where we are in need of bolstering programs and where we are in need of maybe shrinking some programs. So. Okay, I think over there. Um, hi, uh, my name is Courtney Hallstein. Um, I work closely with um, ASPSU here on campus and also with the Oregon Student Association. And uh, here at PSU and across the state, students have um, some concerns about institutional boards and I kind of just specifically wanted to highlight um, two of them. First is that um, in a study done by OUS, um, there wasn't really any clear sign that increased philanthropy would happen as a result of institutional boards and create more revenue for universities. Um, but it did show that tuition um, skyrocketed at like a much more ex exponential rate than at uh, universities with um, state that were part of statewide um, boards. Um, and secondly, I know that the fiscal impact statement came out for, for institutional boards saying that these boards could cost um, from like one to five million per board per year. And I was just wondering, is our students going to have to pay for that? No, well, these, uh, those, those numbers were, uh, were totally nonsensical, frankly. The study that OUS did showed that how the university is governed has no effect on anything that you can really measure. It didn't have an effect on philanthropy. It didn't have an effect on uh, the number of people who get a degree. It didn't have an across-the-board effect on tuition. There was no statistically significant effect. So in and of itself, a board isn't going to lead to any great outcomes one way or the other across the board. This is based on nationwide regression analysis. It means that you have to look at the specific circumstances in a particular state to kind of see what might happen. The case here in Oregon that was a strong case is that there was pretty clear indication that at least the U of O would get significantly more philanthropic revenue uh, if it did create its own board. Based on my own conversations with both philanthropists, civic leaders, politicians, business people around the state, I got the same message. As long as you're seen as a state agency, we're not going to give you money because we're afraid of whatever we give you, Salem will just suck out the back door. Doesn't matter whether that's actually true or not, that's what people believe and therefore it affects their behavior. So that's why I came to the conclusion several years ago already that having a board probably would help us, certainly wouldn't hurt us, and frankly, Part of my motivation was that I was pretty sure the University of Oregon would get its own board. Uh, because of their political power in the state, I did not think that it was good for Portland State to be in the position of having a U of O with its own board while Portland State did not have one. The other point about this number of one to five million dollars, it was an analysis done. Right now, as I said, we do a lot of shared services. You know, everything from some capital planning to benefits. Um, if we stopped doing all of that in a collective way and each university started doing everything by itself and did it in about as stupid a way as possible, then you might indeed spend somewhere between one and five million dollars. As I already mentioned, we are legally mandated, if the bill passes as it's now written, to continue to do the shared services. We are, as a university, very committed to continue to do those shared services indefinitely. The argument for a governing board for Portland State is not because we like processing our own payroll or doing our own treasury service. No, that's not why we're interested in our own board. So as long as we can continue to do those things and they are more efficient to do it together through that group, it's a good thing. But you need to know that right now, you, your tuition, is subsidizing students across the state. Our students are the second poorest of any of the universities. We subsidize the health care of other workers in the state by a million dollars a year. That is your tuition dollars at work for people who have nothing to do with Portland State. That's what the system as it is now structured has done. We are continually collecting your money and sending it to Eastern Oregon, Western Oregon, Southern Oregon. Now, you may say that is social justice, that's equity, maybe. I don't think that having our students, who are the second poorest, borrow money so that some other institution can be functioning is really very good public policy. 
So that's why I think that we need to really think hard about which part of those shared services make sense and which ones are a subsidy that you had no vote in whatsoever. Yes, another question back there. Hi, uh, President Vival. Um, as a student, um, when I'm thinking about education, I'm often thinking about the fact that our country's priorities have really shifted and our federal government seems a lot more concerned with uh, imprisoning young people and sending them off to war than educating them. I wonder what your feelings are about this and whether the administration has ever thought about taking a more activist approach to um, uniting and asking for more state support uh, instead of uh, letting them just continue to spend so much money on prisons and military and continuing to defund education. Absolutely, absolutely, totally. Um, we uh, were the leaders uh, with uh, other universities in creating a lobbying organization called the Oregon Idea, which is a collaborative effort of community colleges, OHSU, uh, the universities, and others. Uh, and they have been involved in the lobbying this year, but they're really gearing up for in the next biennium, along with the governors. You know, as some of you may know the governor is working hard on really rethinking the whole revenue system for the state. Yes, that is code for sales tax, um, because that is the only way. That's the only way that we can generate the resource that we need to develop the kind of higher education system that we all need. So we have been a very active player in that. Are very supportive in it. Are investing some money in it, uh, and we'll continue to be a very active player, because yes, that's the only way we're going to find long-term solutions. Any other, yes? You, you got a mic coming. A decrease in enrollment in uh, School of Education, um, and the proposal of Rudy Crew that uh, there be some kind of a regional um, teacher training facility, would Portland State support that? Uh, can you repeat the first part of your question because you didn't have the well, mic? Well, there's a decrease in enrollment in yeah, yeah. Uh, teacher right. education. So well, would, would Portland State participate in kind of a regional teacher training um, office? I'm, I'm sure we would. I'm, I'm sure that we would. Now, whether that is the best way to go and what exactly that looks like, you know, is still very much uh, under discussion. And uh, given, the, uh, given the headline, uh, uh, what was it, this morning or yesterday? Time flies when we're having a good time. Uh, about a really crew, I, I, I don't know where those ideas are going to go, but uh, we will be a very active participant in whatever ideas around teacher education that come from the Oregon Education Investment Board and the Chief Education Officer. Absolutely. I'm getting the signal that, uh, that we're uh, just about out of time, and uh, I know we got the, the food and the drink, so I don't want to deprive you of that any longer. I just want to, um, you know, re-emphasize, yes, this is very tough. The, the good news about what we're doing is that, frankly, this is now the end of my fifth year. And we've had budget cuts every year. You know, I didn't come here expecting those. I didn't come here wanting those. But that was the hand that we were dealt. So we've had to cut the budget every year. This year's tough. Next year's going to be very tough. The good thing is, if you looked at those numbers, that at that point, our revenues and expenditures are in balance. So to me, the encouraging sign is that we are not just continuing to cut and cut and cut with no end in sight. That assuming the economy continues to just go sort of along, you know, doesn't slide back into another recession, but I'm not counting on some kind of a great rebound, that after next year's exercise of budget cutting, we will be back in balance. That means that we can use whatever new revenue we're able to generate, either because of efficiencies or because of enrollment growth, to begin to rebuild the institution. So that's one good sign. The second thing that makes me very encouraged about Portland State is that we are ahead of the curve with our Rethink PSU program in thinking about how we respond to the onslaught of the MOOCs and all the other things. You know, if you are in a public university that is somewhere out in the, in, in the rural hinterlands that has no natural population base, you're in a world of hurt. And I really do feel for my colleagues who run the small regional institutions because they're going to have a very tough time because even if they shift to online education, 
they can't compete in the long run because they don't have the investment capital to create online courses that are you know, attractive enough and slick enough uh, compared to what Stanford or Harvard or Penn or all these other places can invest in it. Our unique opportunity as Portland State is not the fully online model. It is taking advantage of the fact that we have a large population right here that can actually get to the campus, that can take advantage of the unique learning that takes place when minds rub together, when people are together in a room, where you get a hands-on learning experience, you know, dealing with a watershed problem or dealing with kids in the Kiwanis camp or all the various projects that the faculty and students are so good at here at Portland State. I think that looking forward over the next 10 years, the model that we have been so strong in of deeply engaged teaching, learning, and research will be what continues to work for us. Uh, it means doing some things online as well, getting rid of the things that we don't need to do in person. And you know, we'll have long and hard debates about what that is and how we best do that and in what disciplines and at what level that works best. Uh, but I think that we are ahead of the curve. We are in a favored position combined with that, the fact that the or Portland area is expected to grow by 200,000 people in just the next five years. You know, having that kind of growth, we will get some of those people as well. So we are going to work our way through this, and we will be in a more stable situation. We'll be a lot better off than a lot of other universities, other than, you know, the big elite institutions, the big flagships. They'll be fine, too. There are more students willing to pay the price, so they'll be fine. But, but we, we will get there because of our unique, uh, unique situation. So it's going to be hard. But I do think it is not an unending difficulty. It is one that we can solve and we can address. And it's the work that all of you do. So if there are any other questions that you have, there are note cards in the back that you can uh, write any questions on. And we will get back to you and give you that information. We will put the full PowerPoint uh, on uh, our website and probably a link from the uh, FADM and academic affairs sites as well. And I understand, in fact, the whole session has been uh, videotaped. So if you want to sit through it all again, uh, you can do that or tell your friends and your mom to go uh, watch it. So uh, again, I want to uh, thank all of you for being here and hope you'll be able to stick around and join us for a drink and some food. Thank you very much.